morning, everybody. Almost good afternoon. Thanks for coming out. Uh, hopefully you're not giving up your lunch time. Um, today we're here to talk about uh, how green hydrogen will help us achieve our net zero emissions by 2050. I see a bunch of familiar familiar uh, names on the list here. Good to see pretty good attendance. Um, so there should be a chat function. Uh, as Beth said, I'll try to get to as many questions as I can at the end. Uh, but if you have questions on the way, go for it. So just a quick outline of uh, what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'm going to talk about uh, about our net zero challenge. So what kind of challenge we have ahead of us with uh, climate change and in reducing emissions on our way to 2050. Then I'll talk a bit about what, hyd what is hydrogen. So what does it actually mean? And how do we make it? Then about why we need it, um, what kind of production methods are possible and economic. And then at, at the end, or probably the last half of the presentation will be about uh, end use applications. So what kind of projects do you think uh, will be economic over the next uh, five to 10 years? So before getting into the fun hydrogen stuff, uh, what is the, I'm gonna talk about what the emissions challenge that we have ahead of us. So in Nova Scotia, um, Canada and the rest of the world, um, it's not a small challenge we've got. So in late 2019, the province of Nova Scotia passed the Sustainable Development Goals Act. That act set a target for the province to achieve net zero emissions by 2015. That means basically eliminating all emissions throughout our whole energy system. Um, other levels of government have similar targets. So the city of Halifax uh, is also working on a net zero plan. The federal government uh, has uh, part of the Paris Climate Accords and other liberal uh, initiatives, uh, liberal government initiatives are also working on a plan to reach net zero. Um, so really, this is a, a global challenge that we're all going to have to face over the next 10 years and really the next 30. So this graph shows kind of the historical progress towards emissions reductions in Canada. So there have been efforts over the years to reduce emissions, but the reality is that we haven't had a lot of success. You might notice that the vertical axis here starts at 500 megatons. So it really makes the situation look a lot better than it is. Reaching our 2030 targets is going to be challenging, but we can likely achieve it with today's technology if we start now. Net zero by 2050, on the other hand, is a far more difficult goal, and it will require a rewiring of our whole energy system from the ground up. I think hydrogen is going to play an important part in achieving both 2030 and 2050 targets, um, and it's gathering a lot of, of attention around the world. The stuff I talked about today is mostly not unique to Nova Scotia. It's being studied and implemented aggressively in Europe, Australia, and soon right here in Canada. So what is hydrogen? Hydrogen is the lowest carbon fuel because it doesn't have any. Um, it's got very high energy density on a mass basis, but a very low energy density on a volume basis. 75% um, of the universe is made up of hydrogen, but it's usually tied to some other more complex molecule. So you need to put energy into it to make it into a fuel. So it's not an energy source, it's an energy carrier in most cases. So just like any other energy dense fuel, you need to be careful with hydrogen. It acts similarly to natural gas in most situations, but can be more dangerous in some ways and less in others. It will ignite more readily than natural gas, but it also disperses a lot quicker because it's so light. So it tends to uh, you know, uh, go into the atmosphere, go straight up very quickly. Um, overall, studies have shown that we can mitigate the safety issues with many of the same processes we use in the, in the gas industry today. Uh, natural gas delivery today is very safe and the utility industry in Canada has a really long track record. Um, we know how to deliver gas, gaseous fuels safely. So there's basically three ways to produce hydrogen. Most hydrogen today is gray hydrogen. So you use heat to split natural gas, CH4, into carbon and hydrogen. Then you emit the carbon as CO2. So the environmental benefits here are pretty minimal in most cases, depending on what you are uh, displacing. Um, blue hydrogen uses the same process. So you can also, you also sequester or make use of the CO2. So it's not emitted into the atmosphere. The environmental benefits can be really good if you can, if you can capture all the CO2. The last production method is green hydrogen. So you use wind or solar power to split water molecules using electrolysis. 
This pathway has no emissions, and although it's pretty expensive today, it can be competitive, become competitive with fossil fuels down the road if you're able to scale it up. So why do we need this stuff? You might think that we should just use electricity for everything and build a bunch more wind farms. But if you take a really detailed look at our energy system, you'll see that it's pretty complicated. This slide shows the energy the flows of energy in Nova Scotia. Admittedly, it's a bit old, so this is 2013 data. So today, hydro imports from Newfoundland will, pay, will play a bigger role. But the key part to understand here is that electricity is only one part of our energy system in the province, and it's not even the largest part. So the red bar kind of in the middle, lower part of the screen, that's the total uh, electricity and use. So to me, at least, it seems pretty unlikely that the best way to get this whole complicated system to zero, to zero emissions, is just to simply use electricity for everything and do a massive build out of generation, transmission, and distribution. I suspect and I believe the best design um, for a 2050 net zero energy system is going to be a lot more complicated than that and involve a mix of different fuels and technologies. But don't get me wrong, electrification is definitely going to be an important uh, part where it makes sense. This slide shows a simpler split of our final energy demand in the province. There's many applications where electricity is not a viable alternative for a variety of reasons. To reach net zero, we won't have the luxury of ignoring those, uh, those areas where electrification doesn't work. So you could probably draw a couple of conclusions from here. Um, greening the 25% of our energy demand that's already met with electricity is, al is already in itself going to be a challenge in Nova Scotia. So we still have some of the highest carbon intensity electric grid in Canada. In a few years, we might be the highest emitting in Canada, actually, as other provinces drop transition off coal. The path to a zero emitting electric grid is pretty uncertain. Um, today, it looks like reducing electric generation emissions will require increasing amounts of natural gas plants to back up renewable. So reducing the size of this whole pie, so reducing the size of our energy usage throughout the economy is probably going to be a key element, and it's the cheapest uh, for sure. The energy you don't use is uh, certainly cheaper than any green energy you could buy. The more we can reduce the total pie, the less clean energy we'll need to produce. And greening the other 75% of our energy, so the 75% that's not electricity, um, it's current, that's currently met with petroleum products, natural gas, propane, and biofuels, is really a big challenge. It's, and it's not totally obvious how we will get that to zero. Some of the sectors that are going to be the most challenging to decarbonize, like heavy transportation and industrial processes, account for 40% of our total energy use. So this chart shows the split of different types of demand. Some of the biggest sectors also happen to have the biggest challenges in emissions reductions. See heavy transportation and industrial are nearly 40%. This slide is from Nova Scotia Power, or data from Nova Scotia Power, and it shows the expected long-term impact of different levels of electrification on the overall emissions in the province. Each column represents a different scenario in which they make different assumptions and essentially they model how the electric system will evolve under that set of assumptions. On the left is kind of the reference scenario, with very little change, so very little policy, environmental regulations that are new. And on the far right, um, the high electrification scenario, we might, we might be putting heat pumps in 80 or 90 percent of buildings, um, and banned internal combustion engines, so we have a lot of electric vehicles on the road. Um, and the model determines from that how the electric grid would need to change to satisfy those loads, how many plants are built and what fuels would be used. The red line there is the overall emissions in the province. So while the high electrification scenarios obviously result in greater shares of final energy being delivered by electricity, so the blue bars is the amount of energy delivered by electricity, the red line doesn't actually trend downwards at all. It actually goes up a bit in the highest electrification scenarios. One of the drivers behind that um, is the challenge in decarbonizing our highly seasonal energy demand. So this chart shows kind of the size of that issue. The average daily base load, this chart shows the average base load or the average load on the natural gas grid in Halifax. 
So the average daily base load uh, is about 50 megawatts. So that uh, dotted line at the bottom. But the daily demand in winter can be six or seven times higher than that. So our future clean energy system will need to address the reality that Nova Scotia uses a lot more energy in the winter than in the summer. And the coldest winter days are really uh, what our energy system is built for. So compared to electric systems, gas distribution systems are well suited to this kind of peaky demand. So it's very costly to build electric generation assets and have them sit idle most of the year, only, so, only to use them you know, in the coldest day, in the coldest set of days in the winter. So for that reason, the gas distribution grid will play an important role in reaching that zero. Um, it also provides a set of other benefits to our energy system. So peak demand is one of them. Resiliency is another. All of our infrastructure, all gas distribution infrastructure is underground. Um, energy diversity, so it provides choice. Um, and emissions reduction pathways in sectors that do not have a lot of options, like industry and heavy transportation. So we definitely have some challenges and hydrogen has, we think the potential to be a solution to some of them or many of them. So to figure all this out, late last year, the OERA, so the Offshore Energy Research Association study on hydrogen in the Maritimes was released. The study took a look at the role hydrogen could play in the, the energy system in the Maritimes going forward. So on the road to 2050. Um, with the vision of reaching net zero. The results are pretty interesting. Um, I won't go through the whole report here, um, but if you're interested, you can find the link on our website. Um, but a lot of the findings uh, I will be talking about today. So the report taught us a lot about kind of the potential environmental and economic benefits uh, from developing the hydrogen economy in Nova Scotia and the Maritimes as a whole. The highest demand for hydrogen probably be for building heat and gas utility, the gas utilities will likely lead the way in that. So by 2050, the report said that hydrogen can make up 22% of our final energy demand. So that's a pretty similar fraction to what energy, uh, what electricity makes up today. So displacing stuff like oil for buildings, oil for industry and gas and diesel for transportation, as well as heavier fuels. It can account for 25% of our emissions reductions. So on the way to zero, 25% of those reductions can be attributed to hydrogen. And it'll help us decarbonize some key sectors of the economy. So the fuel for electricity production, to provide heat for buildings and industry and for transportation. It will also provide, it can also provide uh, grid scale energy storage for long durations that batteries really can't uh, achieve today. So the report indicated that green hydrogen production from wind power is likely to have the best value proposition in Nova Scotia. Um, blue hydrogen, so from natural gas with carbon capture, can make a lot of sense in places like Alberta or BC where they have super cheap natural gas, so their natural gas costs are very low, um, and lots of carbon sequestration options. So you know they have lots of empty gas wells and oil wells that uh, you can inject carbon into, CO2 into at relatively low costs. Um, we have neither here, so we don't have super cheap natural gas. We don't have a, a bunch of wells around the province uh, to, that we could sequester carbon in. So the production costs of blue hydrogen and green hydrogen are likely to be pretty similar. Um, green obviously comes out on top because of the better environmental footprint and simpler production. So you don't need any sequestration. You just need a lot of clean electricity and uh, somewhere to put all that gas. So of the renewable options in the Maritimes, wind is the cheapest resource we have. So the um, levelized cost of energy from a wind farm is significantly lower than pretty much any other um, renewable resource. So even solar is uh, relatively expensive, mostly because we don't get that much sun. Um, but long-term solar might become uh, another good option as the costs come down a bit more. So now just a quick primer on electrolysis. So the basic idea um, of, make, of how you make green hydrogen is you use electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. 
you only need about 1.3 volts. But as with most energy conversion processes, you get less energy out as hydrogen than you put in as electricity. So modern electrolyzers can be up to 80% efficient. So the hydrogen out, um, you get about 80% of the energy out that you put in. And depending on the design can be pretty, really effective at following loads like variable wind and solar generation. So a lot of electrolyzers are specifically designed um, to follow loads that are varying um, over, certain, over, time, over short time periods like wind and solar. So when you power that electrolyzer with wind or solar, um, or even tidal, uh, that hydrogen is green and zero carbon. So there's no emissions uh, associated with that energy. So when you burn hydrogen, it just produces energy and uh, water. So now that we know a bit about how to produce it, we need to figure out what kind of end uses could be viable. So this part can be a bit challenging. Uh, because hydrogen is still an emerging technology for a lot of end uses, today it's more expensive than many of the incumbent fossil fuels. So more expensive than fuel oil, uh, coal, or natural gas. Longer term, it should become cost competitive. So uh, you'd expect and a lot of projections show that by 2050, for example, we should be able to produce hydrogen you know, without, without taking into account carbon pricing or incentives, we should be able to produce hydrogen around the same price as natural gas today in the Maritimes. But in the short term, finding the best applications and the best business cases is gonna be a key part of creating a hydrogen economy. So we need to find some of, the be some of these best, cases, best case projects and get started now. Um, so I'll, now I'm gonna give you a rundown of kind of where I think the best opportunities are and where uh, a lot of the rest of the world is uh, going for hydrogen projects. There's a few, few applications that are generally expected to lead the way. Um, and a couple are even cost competitive with fossil fuel options today. I usually think of them as four pillars of a hydrogen economy. Integrated energy system, industry, transportation, and buildings. The value proposition kind of varies pretty widely between, between them, um, but I think we're gonna need to develop all four in the next decade or so if we're gonna reach our goal of net zero by 2050. So the first pillar is integrated energy system. The idea here is that we need to maximize the interconnections between our electric and gas systems, because to reach net zero, um, we need to take advantage of the strengths of both uh, electrical and gaseous energy delivery. This slide here should give you an idea of where I'm going with this. Uh, we already interconnect the gas and electric grids with gas turbines, so turbines produce electricity from gas. But in the future, we're going to need to go the other way. So using electrolysis to produce hydrogen and inject into the gas system. The gas grid is really good at delivering very peaky energy. It, it delivers a huge amount of energy, so six or seven times as much as the summer, as in summer on cold winter days, and really not much in the summer. And it also has massive storage capabilities for seasonal energy storage. You often hear about the cost of batteries and how grid scale battery projects are being developed, but there's still an enormous difference between the energy storage capabilities of chemical batteries and that of the gas grid. So I actually tried to make a graph here comparing the largest lithium battery project in the world to the largest underground natural gas storage cavern, but the difference in energy storage is almost, uh, it was five orders of magnitude, so 100,000 times bigger, the gas storage system. So it was, the graph wasn't super useful. Um, the reality is that for energy storage, underground gaseous storage, whether it's hydrogen or natural gas or whatever, is going to be far more cost effective um, than any kind of chemical batteries for the foreseeable future. So this graph shows kind of where the economics of each type of energy storage lie. So on the vertical axis, you've got release time, so how long you need to store the energy on the horizontal axis, storage capacity. So you can see way up in the right, Hydrogen storage, um, generally in underground caverns, um, is really the only viable uh, scalable storage system. Pumped hydro can be uh, useful, but it's pretty limited geographically. Batteries will certainly be important on shorter time scales, um, but the reality is with our peaking energy system, we're going to need something that has a long time scale storage. 
this is just a quick illustration of the storage challenge. So in northern climates like Nova Scotia, we have a very peaky energy demand curve. On our way to zero emissions, we're going to need to rely more and more on intermittent renewables like wind and solar. So the black curve in the back is energy demand. So it's got a big peak. It's a big peak in the winter months. And in front of that is a variable resource. So it could be wind or solar. Um, wind is a bit more, uh, wind does have a little bit of a peak in the winter, but it's not uh, the six to seven times that our heating demand has. The best wind resource sites are pretty flat year round. So in order to kind of move that energy from the summer into the winter, we're going to need to take advantage of the gas grid storage ability. So we need to consider how, you, how we can use electrolyzers to make hydrogen from electricity. But also, another question becomes, how do we make electricity from gas when that composition of that gas changes? So today we make electricity from methane or natural gas. Um, what are the implications of changing that uh, feedstock or that uh, feed energy to more and more hydrogen? We need to make sure that that's not going to cause problems. So you might often think of fuel cells when uh, you're thinking of generating electricity from hydrogen, but it turns out that at large scales, gas turbines can reach pretty similar efficiency numbers, and they're also a lot cheaper to build today. So this photo might look like a regular gas turbine or maybe just a pile of tubes and wires, um, but it's not. This is a test turbine that uh, was built on test hydrogen blends with natural gas. Baker Hughes completed testing last year with this, which demonstrates that there is potential in the technology. Um, old style combustion turbines can be one of the biggest limiting factors in blending hydrogen into gas networks, uh, but many turbine manufacturers like Siemens and GE are now building and marketing hydrogen ready models. Some of them that can handle blends as well as up to 100% hydrogen. Here's one of the first uh, kind of large scale planned hydrogen turbine projects. This is the 1800 megawatt Intermountain Power Plant outside of Delta, Utah. It's owned by the city of Los Angeles today and produces about 20% of the city's power um, from coal. It's scheduled to close by 2025 and will actually be replaced by a gas turbine power plant that will burn a blend of natural gas and renewable hydrogen on day one. So they're a bit, they're a bit uh, fortunate that the facility actually sits on top of a large salt bed. So it's an ideal place to store hydrogen. They're going to make the hydrogen from a combination of wind and solar and then blend it with low cost natural gas to power the turbines. Over time, the plan is to increase that blend rate and eventually transition to 100% green hydrogen. Another way we can integrate our energy systems is through hybrid heating systems. So the, the idea here is to try to optimize the use of both electric and gas grids inside a single house or a building. You can use electric heat pumps most of the year to provide heating and cooling energy to the space and the water. Um, but at times of high demand on the electric grid, when in Nova Scotia, when all the coal plants are running full blast, you switch to delivered fuels, whether that's methane or hydrogen. That way we minimize the overall emissions from our energy system and also minimize the cost of our energy system overall. So using electric heating systems when they're highly efficient and then switching to delivered fuel when they're not. The same idea can be applied to any building. You can even use, use a geothermal system uh, for your electric and with gas backup or retrofit existing buildings. Um, the economics can be pretty challenging because there's not really a utility rate structure like between the gas and electric utilities. There's not a rate structure that facilitates it or that uh, improves the business case. But uh, hopefully, long term, we'll be able to develop some, and hopefully in the next couple of years. The province of Quebec is actually doing exactly that right now. So they're developing a combined gas and electric utility rate that encourages the optimization of both grids and the use of these kind of hybrid systems. So that first pillar, um, integrated energy systems, is a bit of a doozy. So we have a long way to go to figure out the right path to build a net zero energy system. It can seem easier to just electrify everything, um, but today jurisdictions around the world are realizing that gas grids and electric grids will need to work together to hit the target of zero. Europe in particular is way ahead of North America and they're discovering kind of the limitations of electrification firsthand. The UK is even planning a complete conversion of the gas system to hydrogen by 2050. 
Pillar number two of a hydrogen economy is industry. There are a number of industries that rely on fossil fuels today that will need hydrogen to decarbonize. They typically have high temperature heat requirements or they're using fossil fuels as chemical feedstocks. So these industries' business models are often highly sensitive to energy pricing, so they're competing internationally or even within the country. Um, so to enable them to decarbonize, we're eventually going to need to produce hydrogen at very low cost. These are going to be some of the most challenging areas to get to net zero and some of the biggest reasons we need to start building hydrogen demand now. We don't have a lot of these industries in Nova Scotia, but we're definitely reliant on them in a lot of ways. Fertilizers first. So ammonia fertilizer, NH3, has the highest nitrogen content of any for commercial fertilizer, and it's critical to growing a lot of crops. Urea is also produced from ammonia. Combined in Canada, we produce almost 10,000 tons a year of these two fertilizers. Gray hydrogen produced from natural gas is today is the primary feedstock for these products. Um, we don't produce a lot of this in Nova Scotia, but we definitely consume it. So we're going to need to replace that gray hydrogen feedstock with a low carbon version, whether it's blue or green, um, to, to really eliminate those emissions. Glass, steel, uh, cement, and brick manufacturing all require very high temperature heat, which is currently all produced by fossil fuels, essentially. Typically that's natural gas, but sometimes in Nova Scotia they use heavy fuel oil or even old tires as industrial fuel. So for these sectors, hydrogen may be the only option for decarbonization in the long term. It's difficult to get the, because it's difficult to get the, the high temperatures you need using heat pumps and arc furnaces are, uh, have some similar issues. So the third pillar um, is transportation. In this area, hydrogen has some has actually has some advantages compared to um, some of the incumbents like biofuels, batteries, and even diesel. You can you can think of hydrogen as a different kind of battery. So rather than storing energy in a lithium or lead acid reaction, we store it in a molecular fuel. So that means there's no chemical reaction speed limitations. So the, the speed of fueling is essentially limited only by how big your compressors are. Um, and since hydrogen is so light, you can put a lot more energy and store a lot more energy um, in a vehicle than with lithium batteries. You've probably heard of hydrogen trucks. Um, they've been in development for a while now, and there's some in service around the world today. They have some pretty big advantages over battery electrics, depending on the application. Um, they've got longer range, shorter refueling times, and carry larger payloads. But they're still kind of similar to electric uh, battery electric trucks. They're still a few, few years out from real commercialization. Um, so they're really just electric trucks with hydrogen tanks and fuel cells instead of lithium batteries. What you might not have heard about is hydrogen ready natural gas trucks. So this is still a pretty new area of research, um, but there's been quite, quite a bit work, of work done on these by, out west by companies like Westport. Um, who manufacture fueling systems, natural gas fueling systems. Um, so in many areas of the country and North America, natural gas is already a viable option for truck fleet owners. It's got lower emissions, lower fuel costs, and far lower, lower tailpipe emissions. So we should be able to blend hydrogen into these trucks going forward. They still use, of course, they still, they'll still use internal combustion engines, but if we can blend hydrogen into that fuel, um, we should be able to reduce emissions even more on the way to net zero while we wait for kind of fuel cell and battery electric trucks to come onto the market and to be economic. One application that might surprise you is forklifts. Hydrogen powered forklifts are actually pretty common. So with over 20,000 units operating in the US alone, um, fuel cell forklifts have an exceptionally strong business case because of the short fueling time combined with the lack of emissions. In a, in a closed environment, you don't want to have combustion happening. And in a 24 hour day warehouse operation, for example, it's pretty expensive to have uh, battery electric forklifts just sitting around for half a day charging. For these reasons, uh, in 2017, Canadian Tire, one of the largest retailers in Canada, um, replaced all their lead acid forklifts, lead acid battery forklifts, in two of their biggest Ontario distribution centers with fuel cells. Canadian Tire also makes their own hydrogen. 
So they have electrolyzers on site and they make about 650 kilograms per day. If you, put, if you put that much hydrogen into the pipeline system to heat homes in Nova Scotia, you could heat about 300 houses with zero emitting fuel. Another pretty relatively mature hydrogen technology is buses. Uh, similar to forklifts, the value of fast refueling um, and longer range are the key differentiators when compared to battery options. In really spread out uh, uh, large cities like Halifax, with really, some really long transit routes, it can be impossible to use battery electric buses on some of these routes. The bus fleet of the, of the future will look much different than the diesel-based fleets we operate today. Uh, both hydrogen and battery electric buses will have parts to play, we think. And as technology improves and the costs come down for both of them, um, I expect you know, the competitive position to change pretty significantly over the next decade. So this graph shows the total cost of ownership for fuel cell electric, battery electric, and internal combustion buses. Um, so it combines, kind of combines capital costs, fuel costs, and all other operating costs, and shows you kind of how the total cost of new buses uh, is expected to change the life cycle cost. You can see that improvements in technology and manufacturing volume are going to make both technologies competitive with diesel buses, even without subsidies, um, over the next five to 10 years. The biggest factor is improving the business case for hydrogen is going to be lowering capital costs of vehicles, as well as the cost of hydrogen fuel. All this doesn't mean, unfortunately, all this doesn't mean that we can just sit and wait for these technologies to become economic. Um, so both buses and fueling infrastructure have pretty long life cycles. So the fueling station might have a, life, a lifetime of 25 years. So the longer we wait to act, the more difficult and expensive the transition to net zero will be if we, if we uh, expect to make that by 2050. Hydrogen is also an option in small vehicles. So battery electric vehicles are certainly better for most small car applications, but as the vehicles get bigger into pickup trucks and SUVs, range requirements get extended, um, there will be a place in the market for hydrogen cars. There's a number of large car manufacturers that are already betting, betting heavily on uh, the long-term potential for fuel cell vehicles. Uh, fuel cells have advantages in manufacturing scalability, so they don't have any rare metals in their fueling system. Um, fueling time uh, is much shorter and ranges can be longer. And they should be compelling, they should become compelling as we transition away from internal combustion cars. This car here is a Toyota Mirai. Um, it's a hydrogen car you can actually buy today, but it's pretty expensive and you can only fuel in Vancouver and Quebec City, but uh, these, thing, these things are on the horizon. The, so the first transportation sectors I talked about are relatively mature compared to uh, this last one. So marine vehicles like fishing boats, ferries, and container ships. These vehicles are going to be extremely challenging to decarbonize. They currently run on a variety of heavy, cheap fossil fuels like Bunker C and fuel oil, and they typically require very high energy density fuels to get the range of power they need. So the likelihood of battery electric uh, container ships is uh, basically zero. So for example, there are almost 10,000 for another example, there are almost 10,000 fishing boats in Nova Scotia spread all around the province in some of the most remote locations. Um, so how are we going to power these boats? How are we going to get the fuel to them? And what fuel is it going to be? Uh, to be honest, there are more questions than answers in the marine sector, um, but it's clear that hydrogen is one of a very small list of options for these kind of vehicles. And we're going to have to figure out uh, how we get there. Here is a look at the emissions of the potential alternative fuels for this, this graph, I think is for container ship size vessels. So there's a move towards LNG, so liquefied natural gas happening now, um, but longer term, we're gonna have to look at hydrogen or other hydrogen derived fuels like ammonia to get this sector to net, sector to net zero. Ammonia is an interesting option because it, it's much more energy dense than hydrogen. Making, so it makes the fuel tank size more manageable for these huge ships. We already manufacture it at scale for fertilizer, and it's commonly stored near ports for trade purposes. So uh, it's not that far-fetched. There's also studies being done on hydrogen, uh, and as well as ammonia fueling options. And there's a few pilots underway, um, 
again, as I said, there's more questions than answers when you look at the future of fueling um, marine vehicles, especially the larger ones. The fourth pillar is buildings. Today, this means blending hydrogen into the existing natural gas grid and delivering it to uh, buildings around Nova Scotia. This is perhaps and likely the most impactful measure we can take in the short term to start building hydrogen demand and production in the province. And it's where I spend, I spend quite a bit of my time now. This slide shows the evolution of the gas grid, the expected evolution of the gas grid. So it's all fossil gas in 2020. We expect to start blending RNG, so renewable natural gas made from biogas uh, from waste organics. So it can be landfills, organics facilities, so green bin facilities, um, wastewater plants, uh, that kind of thing. So we'll blend RNG and then hydrogen. There's two potential limiting factors on how much hydrogen we can blend into a gas system. So the distribution system itself and then the end users. In Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, uh, we're pretty fortunate to have modern, recent gas distribution systems. So we don't have any iron pipes and we have very little steel, mostly plastic. So that means we avoid the biggest issue that can occur in a distribution system, hydrogen embrittlement. So high, this is when high concentrations of hydrogen can penetrate some types of steel alloys and make them brittle, which can quickly lead to failure. So we shouldn't have a lot of issues with that. That means that the likely limiting factor in Nova Scotia is end uses. We already talked about power generation, natural gas vehicles, and industry. So that leaves us with um, kind of the many boilers and furnaces connected to the gas grid today. So I think of, I think of this challenge of hydrogen blending in kind of four steps. The first step is what we can do today. So without changing anything for the end use appliances, um, we, could ba we basically make sure that the fuel used, the fuel received by these appliances doesn't change in any measurable way outside of the uh, expected kind of variation in gas quality that we get normally. This step is limited to somewhere around 5% hydrogen. Um, step two is the existing technical potential. So here, this is where we start to kind of push the limits of what's technically possible for these existing appliances to handle. Um, there's a lot of work being done already in this area, and the general consensus seems to be that uh, the, the, this, the limits here land somewhere around 20%. So the vast majority of appliances in use today with no, with no changes could handle blends of 20% hydrogen. Whether or not they, get, they would be warranted or supported by manufacturers here is subject of a lot of work right now, um, but technically, um, the research is showing that they will work. After that point, hydrogen becomes, after 20%, hydrogen starts to become a pretty big element of the fuel. So the variation in hydrogen concentration becomes important. For example, most appliances are probably okay up to 50% hydrogen, but if that concentration sometimes goes down to 10% or up to 70%, you start to run into big issues like flashback and problems with metering. Um, it starts to become a bit more complicated. So skipping over step three um, the, to the last step, a zero emitting gas grid where 100% hydrogen is delivered um, through the distribution system. Technology wise, this grid is not, too not really that much different from today. Boilers and furnaces would be designed a bit differently so to account for the lower energy density of hydrogen, but they would otherwise operate basically the same way as they do today, just with a different fuel. Step three, so back, going back a step, um, or exactly how we get to 100% hydrogen grid is a bit more unknown. So we still need to figure out how to blend increasingly higher concentrations of hydrogen into the gas grid without affecting end use appliances. We probably have a decade before we get close to here. Um, so there's a lot of work you know, even to get to 20%. Uh, but once we start exceeding that, we need to start considering change, either changing out appliances for hydrogen ready ones over time, or, you know, novel ways to blend hydrogen into the grid to make sure that the fuel that those appliances see is a uh, stable energy content or even converting that hydrogen to methane so you can methanate it uh, through different chemical processes and uh, that way the fuel will be chemically identical to natural gas so still a lot of questions i guess between 20 percent and 100 percent hydrogen 
So four pillars. We have a lot of work to do between these four pillars. Um, so the federal government has also released a hydrogen strategy with some pretty aggressive goals. They, so they envision Canada to become becoming a hydrogen exporter to markets like Europe and Asia. So we're already preparing to become importers. Um, so to get there, we're going to need to start acting now. Similar to most of the other critical path items that will get us to net zero by 2050, we don't really have a lot of time to spare. At Heritage Gas, our task over the next year or so is to build some, start building some consensus around these four pillars and start developing some lighthouse projects. So these projects should maximize, we're going to need to maximize the economics of hydrogen appliances and attract funding from government as well as cooperation from the private sector. That's what it's going to take to succeed. It's going to take a lot of different uh, industries working together as well as uh, government funding. So some of the best lighthouse projects, I think, are likely to be the ones that combine multiple end uses. So fueling a truck plus injecting hydrogen into the natural gas grid or electric grid balancing services plus high heat industrial consumption. Um, combining end uses like this will allow us to maximize kind of the economics of hydrogen production and consumption. So we take advantage of high value applications like vehicle fuel, as well as low value, high flexibility applications like gas grid injection. That brings us to kind of the end. Thanks very much for your time today. Um, for, for any more information, you can visit a betterwayforward.ca. You'll find some pretty pictures, videos, and research studies, and examples of kind of what hydrogen work is happening around the world today. And I think we've got some time for questions. I can share the slide deck. Uh, Beth, I don't know if I, could, if I can get that to you and you can uh, send that around. That might be easier. Absolutely. Or we can put it on our website. We'll figure out how to share the slide deck. So Dale asks, new wind and solar energy products projects produce electricity at a cost of about four cents per kilowatt hour. If that energy is used to create hydrogen, is it cost effective to you? to then use the hydrogen in vehicles. Um, vehicle fuel is kind of one of the uh, interesting areas where hydrogen already has a cost advantage over um, diesel. So diesel on an energy basis is pretty expensive actually. Um, so today the actual fuel, hydrogen fuel, would be cost competitive with diesel. The challenge is buying the vehicles. So in many cases, the vehicles are quite expensive or not available. Um, in the forklift scenario, they are available and they're produced in large numbers. So that's one of the big reasons that they're cost effective today. But in like heavy trucking or um, marine vehicles may or may not be available or cheap. James Friars asks, how do liquid metal batteries compare to green hydrogen as a way to source sur surplus energy from renewables? Um, so I'm not sure about liquid metal batteries, um, but chemical batteries like lithium or uh, lead acid generally are better, cheaper for short term storage. So if you're looking to balance wind, you know, over a day, maybe or hours, um, they're going to be more cost effective. But if you're looking to deal with seasonal imbalances, uh, hydrogen will, will definitely be more cost effective. And there's kind of a continuum between those two kind of ends of the spectrum where you know, uh, chemical batteries and hydrogen can be relatively similar in cost effectiveness. Mark asks, is hydrogen volatility a risk or concern? Um, so volatility, uh, I think you're probably referring to kind of flammability and safety issues. There have been quite a bit of studies on um, the safety issues around hydrogen and Generally, the results are that it sure definitely has some safety challenges, um, but they're not totally dissimilar to natural gas or other delivered fuels. Um, so generally, uh, the belief and the result of these studies has been that we can deal with these safety challenges.
Marcel asks, does Heritage Gas plan on becoming an electrical producer for producing hydrogen, or is the plan to leave electrical production to others? Any thoughts on small scale nuclear generating plants? Um, so Heritage Gas, today our parent company, Fry Summit Utilities, is already an electrical producer. Um, so we own a couple of wind farms out west. Um, but I would say not, nothing has necessarily been decided as far as what we're going to do to become uh, as far as hydrogen production. I think we're interested in the actual production, so the electrolysis. Um, but the key part is to build projects that are viable. So if there's other parties that can um, operate wind farms cheaper than we can, then uh, kind of the viability of projects is really important. Um, Are there any are there any end use equipment available now for facilities like office buildings, schools, and health centers? Um, a lot of larger. So the end use. I'm not sure what you mean by end use equipment. Uh, for HVAC, most HVAC equipment today can already handle 20% hydrogen. Um, longer term, um, especially in the larger. Uh, Larger appliances, you can just you can literally change out your burner um, in order to burn uh, different percentages of hydrogen. As long as again you can have a relatively stable concentration, you can't have hydrogen your hydrogen concentration moving up and down once you get past twenty percent. Chris asks, uh, wind peaks in the winter. Confirm your source showing a higher wind production in summer versus winter. Um, I my that data didn't show higher in the summer. It's a relatively flat line. Um, might not have looked looked perfect on the uh, on that chart, but it was a relatively flat line source. Could have been the big peak in the winter is the um, heating. And the the key part of that slide is the winter peak um, for heating demand is six to seven times higher. Um, so. I don't think wind production is six to seven times greater in the winter. David asks, is increasing the distribution pressure in the natural gas grid possible to offset the lower density of hydrogen? Yes, the answer is yes. That's certainly one of the options. Um, we're also uh, fortunate that our gas system in Nova Scotia at least um, has a lot of excess capacity, um, so we don't expect. You know, we we would have to get uh, pretty high to pretty high hydrogen concentrations before uh, we would have to change pressures or increase the pressure to uh, increase energy delivery. Can you speak to the safety of hydrogen storage and transmission? Can it combust at very low temps and is odorless and tasteless. Um, so similar to natural gas, natural gas is actually also odorless and tasteless, um, but we add a Odorant to, uh, so you can smell. Similarly, there's odorants in development. So there's no odorant today that will work for super, like 100% hydrogen, but uh, it's an area of a lot of development right now. Um, 